We're here with Alex Nascimento, the professor of the UCLA Blockchain Lab and the author of The STO Revolution. Welcome to Dubai and our podcast at the Future Blockchain Summit. Thanks, Oscar. It's a pleasure to be here. So you'll be giving a workshop and you give workshops all over the world to corporates and at the university as well. Tell us about what is the education that you provide? Yeah, so I teach a few courses on blockchain and blockchain application uh, for businesses and finance. Um, the whole idea is to educate students, executives, and entrepreneurs to understand how the technology works without necessarily needing to have the technical knowledge of being a coder or a developer, right? Um, so throughout the years, we started this effort at the university in 2017. Uh, we gave corporate education to a number of companies, including the China Everbright Bank uh, and other financial institutions in the U.S., uh, FICO, which does uh, credit scoring for American citizens, and so forth and so on. And the whole idea is not only to educate students at the university, we also have an open course online for anyone that's looking to get more education on that, they can go UCLA blockchain, it will show up, it's open to anyone. But uh, we're also looking to bring it here to Dubai so that we can share the knowledge with the local community of uh, people interested in the space. It's really cool. So UCLA will be offering courses here in Dubai? That's the plan? Well, actually UCLA wouldn't be offering courses here. UCLA offers them online, uh -huh. uh, which is open to any Dubai citizen or or actually anyone around the world can go online and sign up for the UCLA course. Uh, we will be in a private effort doing workshops here at your event uh, to educate the community here of lawyers, service providers, accountants, and executives in general that want to learn more about Web3 and how this is going to disrupt their business or industry. So 2017, that was very early to be doing education at an academic level on blockchain. And now a lot of universities are offering such courses. How is uh, your course different and how has it evolved over the years? Yeah, so we went through all the different cycles that the industry went through since 2017. Uh, we, to a certain point, right at the beginning, we even covered ICOs before they became uh, deemed to be unregulated securities offering. Mm -hmm. But as the SEC stepped in in the United States and started regulating the industry, we took a very strong focus in showing how regulatory frameworks make blockchain technology and other Web3 technologies compliant with local jurisdiction. And that's another area that I think it's very important here in Dubai, right? Dubai is going to become one of the greatest hubs for Web3 technology and the work that you guys do, not only at JITAX, but also at blockchain, uh, Future Blockchain Summit shows that. You're seeing a lot of inbound of foreigners, startups, investors, funds, uh, looking to, to have their headquarters here in Dubai because here you have the regulatory framework you have the economic stability and the rule of law that allows that to happen. So you have a very interesting role in being in academia and covering so many areas around the world in so many different industries. You mentioned FICO, China. Um, what is the blockchain Web3 opportunity for corporates today? What is it that they need to know to take advantage of it? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think that over the years we're going to we have been seeing this, but we'll see it more. Less and less we'll, we'll hear the word blockchain, and more and more we're gonna hear the, the blanket word uh, Web3, right? Which is the integration of all these frontier technologies. Now, the closest thing you have to your daily routine is your phone, which operates on a 5G, depending on the uh, region you are, maybe on a 6G, right? And if you think about that, uh, blockchain itself or a decentralized ledger technology is going to be the core foundation that glues all these technologies. But Web3 essentially is bolted by a couple of things. Uh, cryptocurrencies, 
um, NFTs, metaverses or online environments, AR, VR, machine learning and AI, as well as other decentralized applications. So you're going to see these technologies converging and affecting mainly every single industry in the planet. So if you're an, if you're an executive in logistics, I would certainly uh, recommend that you take a course on blockchain and how blockchain can improve your logistics. If you are a lawyer, you should certainly know a lot about these topics and the taxonomy behind this so that you can apply the laws in your jurisdiction to the technology that's going to be implemented. So your book, The STO Revolution, I understand you will be doing a fourth edition coming out early next year. How is it going to be updated from the first release? Yeah, the first, uh, we did two, three releases already, right? And it has been evolving because the industry evolves so fast. So we try to cover in every edition the newest things that are happening in frontier tech. Uh, in this one, we're going to cover CBDCs, which is a very hot new topic, and how central bank digital currencies are going to impact different businesses, and how you're going to be able to do Forex exchange across different CBDCs. Uh, we're also going to be covering NFTs and metaverse, among other new technologies. The idea of the book, like I mentioned, similarly to the course, is to help people that are not developers or don't have the technical expertise of software development to understand the technology. So the big thing in the last couple of weeks has been WorldCoin. How do you see that and uh, the blockchain element in and the connection to digital assets and uh, biometrics? Yeah, certainly today we have a pending issue in the industry, right? Which is cybersecurity. If, if, you're, if your crypto wallet is compromised, then... then it's you, just your crypto you, wallet. Right, yeah. Then, then you lose your funds. You potentially could lose your funds, right? Uh, the other side of, of your wallet uh, being not attached to your ID, which happens in your bank account, right? If I want to, if there is a, a suspicious transaction in your bank account, your bank account has all your documentations attached to it. Today, we don't have this in crypto, right? You do have some form of KYC and AML attached to a wallet, but that, that isn't necessarily uh, bulletproof. And I'll give you an example. Uh, you can buy KYC and AML information online fraudulently, right? Pass uh, KS KYC and AML tests in any centralized exchange and attach a different wallet to that uh, user profile. But now if you have biometrics attached to your wallet, then that becomes significantly a much more bulletproof uh, system of not only maintaining your assets, your digital assets secure, but understanding that you're the person responsible for the transactions in that wallet. But if you take it one step further, great that you've got biometrics secure in your wallet, but if your biometrics get hacked, then everything tied to that biometric ID is jeopardized. And compare that to when you have a bank account, the bank account is responsible for your funds and they're insured by the mm -hmm. government typically. Isn't it opening up uh, quite a risk for individuals to at all be placing their biometrics on the blockchain? Um, yes, there is a strong argument to what you're saying, right? But then it's kind of like this, uh, it's kind of saying that all the biometrics that you're sharing all over the world uh, are in danger of being hacked, right? Today you go to like any airport, anywhere around the world, and you're sharing your biometrics. You're putting your hand there, yeah. uh, you're putting your, your face. It, it was actually interesting because I came to Dubai this time to visit you guys. Thanks for welcoming me. Thank you. Um, and I was surprised because uh, at the gate there, they said, have you been to Dubai in the past 10 years? And I said, yes, I've been here like maybe 18 months ago. And then I showed my passport, and I didn't even show my passport. It recognized my face, had my full name, 
my U.S. citizenship and it allow me to enter. Yeah, it's amazing. It's astonishing that what how advanced it is. Right. I didn't even need to pick my passport from my pocket. Yeah, but then your biometrics is tied and verified by you as a person. But uh, if you're verifying yourself remotely and it's possible to hack the biometrics, I don't necessarily like the idea that someone can steal my biometrics and then use it or tie my biometrics to other wallets and so forth. Um, especially if there is no recourse, like the, what's, what is working well with the banking system nonetheless is that there, there is accountability if funds are misappropriated. Yeah, that is a good point. Uh, there are projects that are working on that. Jumio is one that it's working on that. Uh, J-U-M-I-O. Uh -huh. um, they, I was just talking to a exchange this morning and they were telling me that they're using Jumio, which does the verification that you are alive, that that biometric isn't like a steady biometric that was bought off o over the internet, right? Mm -hmm. So when you take your picture with your ID next to you, uh, Jumio does the recognition if you're alive. Interesting. Interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you can't kill someone <laughs> and just... <laughs> yeah, and just put someone standing there. Or take a picture of that person and... Yeah, I would, that, that is so fascinating that we're moving towards that, that um, we're not going to need any, um, uh, we're just going to have, we're going to be chipped and uh, you, you, you are your assets, essentially. Yeah, and uh, we wrote an interesting thesis about it and happy to share. It's like, you are already semi-chipped, right, which is your phone. Mm. How long can you be away from your phone? Yeah. And as, I can't get access to any bank accounts without my phone. Yeah. I'm very curious to hear about your work with the Brazilian Central Bank and their work on a new CBDC. Uh, tell us, they are using blockchain in that solution? Yeah, so the Brazilian Central Bank is uh, launching its uh, CBDC. It's called the Real Digital. Uh, different than what you're seeing in China, it's not a, a retail CBDC, it's a wholesale CBDC. But what does that mean? It means that, so let's, let's go two steps behind, right? You, if you issue a CBDC, what you're doing is that you're issuing a stable coin that's pegged to your country's fiat, mm -hmm. right? Which is issued by the central bank. Uh, in most jurisdictions of most advanced countries around the world, the central bank will issue money and then um, banks and other financial institutions like payment institutions will receive those deposits, right? So a financial institution will receive deposit from me and you, but it will also have the backing of the deposits that come from the central bank. Uh, so in that distinction you have in China, what they're doing is uh, retail CBDCs. The CBDC is issued by the Chinese central bank and it ends up directly in the wallets of the average uh, citizen. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, a, couple, a, a little bit differently, the Brazilian Central Bank is tokenizing three different assets. It's tokenizing the deposits that the Central Bank gives to all the different banks and payment institutions. It's tokenizing the deposits that me and you deposit in our own banks. And it's tokenizing the, um, uh, the Brazilian debt or the Brazilian bond, well, similarly to the US bond, right? Uh, so, so now you have three types of assets that are being tokenized. What that allows, it will allow that most financial institutions will issue their own stable coin. So what is the function of the central bank tokenizing deposits and their debt? It's already tokenized in the sense that you trade on it. Yeah, so you, you have a couple of different uh, benefits. The three key benefits that it's now in discussion and mainly in the agenda is A, uh, decentralization and scalability of the, of the, of the platform, right? Uh, together with a few other central banks around the world, Brazil is utilizing Hyperledger Bezo as its uh, decentralized ledger technology platform. Uh -huh. So scalability is one, which is how can I connect my uh, blockchain or my central bank CBDC to other decentralized ledger technologies, 
such as Ethereum, such as potentially on the future Bitcoin, Hyperledger Bezo is EVM compatible or Ethereum compatible. Mm -hmm. So how you can plug in those other decentralized ledger technologies, which starts to become the real um, use case for a Web3 economy, where you have these multitudes of economies all interacting together. So in a global world economy trading on debt and the deposits, is it going to be more efficient? Mar is it going to be a more efficient market as a result of this? It's going to be traded more broadly? Is there going to be better transparency? Or how does it impact the actual valuation of these assets? Yeah, so you, you have a series of benefits, right, which we can spend here a long time covering them. But mainly what you see is transparency, mm -hmm. right? You, you have a very clear view of the asset that you're buying. You can implement, which is the second main piece of the agenda of the Brazilian Central Bank, which is programmability. So you can program payments and you can create things that are delivery versus payment or payment versus payment. I'll give you an example. Um, in Latin America, people are generally skeptic and you go buy a car, right? So you're, you're, you have the, the question. Should I pay the person and then go transfer the title to my name? Or do I transfer the title to my name and then pay the person? Yeah. Right? And you're kind of always in that. Like, you have to be in the same room and do it at the same time. time. Yeah, <laughs> right? So how do you do that in a Web3 environment where you make the payment and the smart contract acknowledges that the, the owner of the car received that payment and immediately transfers the title of the car or the house or the asset. Yeah. Right. And then by creating the framework to tokenize the Brazilian bond, you're allowing that framework to be utilized for all these other different assets and really implement delivery versus payment. And then the third point is, uh, is um, uh, data protection, right? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do, as a central bank, uh, they make sure that your, your data is secure, that you're not being exposed. Because as you, as you know, in blockchain generally, uh, if you send me a Bitcoin from your wallet, I can track your wallet and see, at least for that wallet that you used, your yeah. entire history. But the critics of CBDCs, seeing that these currencies are programmable, hypothetically, it can be restricted to be used only for certain um, <clears throat> consumption and once you have it's not really your money anymore if they afterwards say now you can only use it for they restrict how you can use the currency yeah it is it is a two side coin right your argument is correct there is restrictions that can be implemented uh, the benefit is that for example in social welfare you can guarantee that the money that the government is giving the, the family is going to be directed to things like food and uh, school supply and transportation to work, right? And, uh, and food or medicine. Uh, so things that are appropriate for that welfare program. You can also make sure that monetary policy is being correctly implemented, right? You're not, um, you're not losing track of what's happening. The flip side and the negative side is what you pointed out, which is as an, as an end user, you kind of lose a bit of your privacy and your sovereignty of those funds. Especially if cash gets uh, removed from the economy, like a government can say no payments are allowed to be made to my, <laughs> to the competing party, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, I think then, then you start going into the realms of, uh, of political mayhem, yeah. which I don't think that they're necessarily connected with monetary policy. Um, the issue of this, this whole scale of CBDCs around the world, and I, would, I just came from Beijing to here, and I was on a panel with the executives from BIS, which is the, the central bank of yes. the central banks, um, and they were talking about like how they're integrating this, right? So that we can have a much more fluid and efficient payment system across the world where people can come to other countries 
and utilize their money and really don't be restricted on, uh, on where can they go and, or how they can spend their money. But, but that's from a, a monetary perspective. If you, if you take it from the risks of, of a central bank uh, being nosferious and utilizing that overarching power to control and a dictatorship, then I think that that's a little bit outside the realms of monetary policy and maybe like a political issue. I guess they intersect. I mean, when you look at so much of the economy, there's so much self-destructive consumption. If you look at it, I mean, they tried to ban soft drinks in New York, and that had quite a um, revolt. Back, yeah, yeah c quite a that. And, and now, like, we're looking at if you can program a currency that you can't buy unhealthy foods. I mean, I, in a way, I'm all for it, but... <laughs> It uh, does restrict, but, but, but talking about before we move on from monetary policy, negative interest rates, that, that would really have a chance to, uh, to fuel the economy suddenly if you would need to. Yeah, yeah. They're like everything, right? There are pros and cons. Uh, I believe that if you are in a free society or if you are in a developed country, you're probably not going to see those issues with CBDCs because it's not in the interest of any government to do such, right? The, the interest of the central bank in most of these nations is a, is a, a detached central bank from the, from the, from the presidential um, the powers in, in place, and like in the US or in Brazil or in many other countries. Uh, what, but certainly out of the 90% of central banks that are looking at this, you might get some uh, bad apples among them. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, it changes everything, what can be done in controlling the economy and behaviors once yeah, this is in place. Yeah, for sure. So talking about China and Brazil, I hear there's a BRICS coin coming up. That's going to also change the world economy, I can imagine. Yeah, uh, we're seeing a move, and that goes back to being a, a political move, right, which is different than the technology. The technology is there to enable what people do with the technology, then I think that that's a secondary discussion. Uh, but we're seeing the BRICS come together and trying uh, in a positive effort, I believe, to move away from the sovereignty of the dollar and to create their own coin or to create a coin that would be a second option to the dollar, right? I think that they can coexist. I don't think the dollar is gonna go away. But as we're seeing more and more uh, financial assets become available, uh, I think you're also gonna see more and more strong currencies. Mm -hmm. um, for those that are in supply chain, they probably heard about the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is this big blockchain that, that the Chinese uh, government is promoting across, I think now over 70 countries of uh, air, train, and, uh, and sea logistics. Um, and then they potentially could use this coin to, to uh, create transactions. I mean, when you look at the BRICS economies, that is what percentage of the global economy is that? And if they have their own currency for trade and sur bypass the US dollar, that really changes the balance of power. Yeah, yeah. And what do you, and on that point, how do you see uh, Fed, the Fed digitizing their dollar and uh, the CBDC there? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting question. We had that same question in Beijing, right? Um, which is, it's, we're, I think we're living a, a digital revolution and it's not gonna go away, right? And that's the point of what we're doing here is bringing education so that corporations and high-level executives, lawyers, accountants, service providers, and everybody that's not living the day-to-day -day that you and I live with this technology can prepare and adapt to the wave that's coming. And, and what happened in the Fed is, is something like along those lines. During the pandemic, the Fed had a discussion about issuing the, CB, the US CBDC, but it faced two main issues. One issue was that the Fed doesn't really have retail experience, right? It doesn't really have like a branch. Yeah. It doesn't really have, it doesn't issue debit cards. It doesn't have a 1-800 call the Fed, I forgot my password. So that project really didn't take off. 
Uh, but you fast forward to 2023, all these other central banks are issuing their coin and the U.S. Uh, found itself in need of following uh, this, this technological revolution or else it would be disrupted. And, and now, recently, the Fed introduced FedNow, right, which doesn't include a blockchain. Um, how do you see that? I mean, payments don't require necessarily that you have a blockchain solution. Yeah. Uh, well, it will probably follow what happened in Brazil and what happened in India, right? Mm. Uh, it wasn't a blockchain. It was more of a decentralized ledger-like technology where you can make instant payments. Uh, and then that would create adoption of, of general usage of that technology of making instant payments between people. So that when you evolve to a CBDC, that's a natural evolution. Uh, people are already familiar with just utilizing their phone and sending and paying you immediately. So to finish off, tell us what we can expect at the workshop at the Future Blockchain Summit. Yeah, so I would like to welcome all the participants to come join us at the workshop. Uh, we're very excited about covering the latest technology that's happening in Web3, so people of different industries can understand what's happening and can have that aha moment of how is Web3 going to impact their business. But not only that, we're also covering the regulatory environment that's happening here in Dubai, right? which is a very friendly regulatory environment but it needs to be taken care of with caution so that you take advantage of the opportunities, but you actually do them in the right way for your business model. Um, so we're gonna not only, not only be covering the tech, but also the legal framework that is available here in Dubai and how people and executives and entrepreneurs can take advantage of that. Sounds very promising. We're honored to have you. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.